Would you like to discover a new way to attack against e4, e5? Hey there, I'm Grandmaster Max Sillingworth, and in this training, I will share with you the Mamajara of attack. It's a line of the Vienna, where after black plays knight f6, we play the move d4. It's also true that this system here with knight c6 and queen d3, which is the starting position of the Mamajara of attack, putting the queen on d3, rather than the old main line of queen e3, or the way ye variation of queen c4. Uh, it's worth pointing out you can also reach this via the center game move order with take, take, knight c6 and queen d3. However, I consider this move order a little bit less precise as black has the option of playing d5. And after ed5, knight b4, black does regain the pawn with actually very good play in this position. So the idea of playing the knight c3 move order first is basically to avoid that d5 option. It's worth pointing out this move order doesn't make it a complete repertoire because they could play to move knight c6 and avoid d4. But then some other options like bishop c4 and g3 do gain a little bit in strength and that's something that you may indeed like to explore in your own time. By the way, if you are enjoying this video sh so far, do make sure to do hit a thumbs up button and also to consider subscribing. Now after bishop queen to d3, there are a few options at black's disposal here, and I have selected some very nice wins by white from recent online Grandmaster games with Mamadrov, as you might expect being the leading exponent. In terms of white's general plan, white basically wants to castle long and then go for a pawn storm attack on the king side when black castles short. And this is a plan that, you know, of course, if black plays correctly, black is going to be fine out of the opening. But practically speaking, this does set some interesting questions, and Black can't really just play passively. If he plays like d6 and you know, something like this, then it's just going to be very easy to play like h4 and just ram that h pawn down the board and create threats against the Black King in that way. Uh, with you know a very pleasant position for White, you know this sort of attack may remind you of, for example, the English attack in the Open Sicilian. So if you like that approach of the pawn storm, then you know this will be quite a natural fit for you, I believe. As to some other possibilities, you know the ones you'll face most often will be the move bishop b4. That's the most common one. Whereas the move bishop c5, you're also going to see a bit, and it's actually probably the better move between the two. But before I get into that, I do want to also point out the move d5 because we did see that with the knights not being on c3 and f6, that this was a very good move for black. A difference here, though, is that we're not forced to take on d5 and walk into this knight b4 idea, uh, which, as we can see, is a little bit of an, a nuisance. But instead, we can play to move bishop to f4. Um, this is improving, by the way, on a game played between Suleimanli against Paravian in chess.com rapid 2022. And the idea is that, you know, if they play d4, we can sort of take and their king will be stuck in the center. And if d4, we have knight b5 and... Now, I'm not sure how often you're going to face this line per se, but turns out that this position is basically going to be about equal, say, takes and long castles, bishop d7, and yeah, you kind of have a choice of options, but, you know, like bc3, something like this would be, would be fairly normal. You know, the position is, is ultimately going to be about equal after, after our c takes d4, and, and yeah, white's going to have a nice edge with these pawn structure, unless black plays bishop a4, and you know, forces a draw in, in this way, like bring the bishop back and forth, as our rook can't escape the, the attacks, as it were. And if you do need to win, you know, you can play bishop c7 first and, and keep the game going in that way, uh, again, with a roughly equal position. But yeah, d5 is admittedly a good theoretical solution, but it's also true that this move is very likely to take your opponents by surprise, where d5 is only really the move you play if you've looked at it with the engine and know that it's fine for black. And also in the Lee Chess Explorer, what I saw is that in the 2500 plus games on Lee Chess, and this also applies for 2000 plus games, white scoring a very high 53% win rate. And when you calculate the draws and the losses and turn to a percent score, it comes to about a 56.5% score for white, which is definitely well above the average. I think that's because white's plan is just so easy to implement where you're just playing the same setup in, in general. So Bishop F4, um, now we're going to have a look a little bit at, at what happens if in the bishop c5 lines, where black is normally going to play d6 sooner or later, because otherwise the 
E5 move can potentially be an issue later on. And the next move here might surprise you a little bit where you might notice that, well, the pressure on the F2 pawn seemingly limits our options a bit. But actually it turns out that castling long is a, a very valid way to play where we can actually sacrifice this pawn and black really should take it because allowing white to go F3 and just get this pawn the G5 is is going to give white a pretty nice attacking setup as, as we see a few times. So black really should take the pawn. But we do get quite decent compensation here where, for example, if black were to play bishop b6 and try to safeguard the bishop, our general plan is just to go for the pin knight d5 and just really mess up the black structure. And yeah, they can kick our bishop away, but then we can, you know, tuck our bishop to e1, swing it around then to c3, and, and white's going to have very good compensation because of the very exposed position to black king. No, by the way, the black's a very long way also from castling long to sort of consolidate the extra pawn. The more critical line, though, which I do want to share with you just to so you kind of know what the worst case scenario is when playing this variation. It's a move of castles, and one thing that often comes up is our rook, you know, is facing opposite the queen, but our own queen is kind of in the way, and therefore we can play queen e2, and then bishop g5, and, you know, set up a pin here, and it's a position where the engines initially give black a bit of a small edge, but as you go deeper, it turns out that white is more or less getting sufficient compensation for the pawn. Um, something else I kind of forgot to mention at the start of the video, but actually, this queen d3 I didn't actually discover originally myself, but, well, remember I was playing for a while, but it was actually a Twitter thread of Nikos and Turles, the correspondent I am in chess theoretician, that kind of gave me the idea to cover this in a video format, with this kind of being a little bit of an expansion of the ideas he covered on Twitter. Um, but yeah, in this case, you know, black should probably play the move rook to e8 and pressure our pawn. And then the possible sample line is knight d5, you know, again, using the pin to our advantage. Bishop f5, take, take. Uh, we defend our pawn with knight d2. Um, in fact, it would also be interesting to explore what happens if we just let them take the pawn and play a double pawn sack. But knight d2, I think, is probably just the best move here. And black has a few options, like bishop e6 would be fairly normal, and, you know, knight b4 is another approach where, you know, I can choose whether to, you know, take and just play c3 and just play for this more like long-term sort of compensation or we can keep a bit more tension in the position with knight c3 and sort of make the point that you know black's pieces are going to get kicked back you know with a3 and you know, king b1 i mean white's going to have decent compensation i mean it's true that black does probably have the better side of equality here which is kind of the price you pay for playing a system that just completely aims to avoid fury altogether on the other hand, it's also true, Black had to find quite a few precise moves to get to this point. And even here, we still have pretty good practical chances uh, with, because of the weakened position of Black's king and our play on the on the light squares. So that's an illustration of kind of the worst case scenario. But I think if you're reasonably happy to play this position, then you're probably going to really love this, this line in general. And with that being said, I now want to focus on the main line of bishop b4. Well, it's a main line sense being the most common continuation. But it's a move that I think we can be quite happy to see in general. Where um, actually both bishop d2 and knight e2 are both quite thematic. But I kind of like starting with bishop d2 just because it's that tad more flexible. Where, for example, let's say instead of rook e8, if they played a move d6. Because you've sort of developed the king with long castling faster. You get some favorable extra options like queen g3 and sort of going for a more active, you know, English attack style setup. Um, note, by the way, black's not just winning a pawn here because knight e4 would allow queen takes g7 mate. That's uh, that's something we should keep in mind. Uh, now, in this case, black should probably just play rook e8, but after knight g2, yeah, we're just able to kind of keep our pawn on e4 well defended. We're sort of a theme in this line that we are nursing that space advantage in the center. And at this point, Black has, you know, kind of two, or actually three sort of options they can kind of go for. Actually, let's say two, like the third one I was thinking was d5, but it's kind of just blundering a pawn. So we don't need to need to go too deep into it. Uh, it was a game of Jurabale against Xiong, which, which was a nice demonstration of, of why d5 is not so great here. So Black can kind of choose between either d6 first, or playing the immediate knight e5 and... We'll make d6 our main line, but knight e5 is, of course, a, a very direct move also. 
uh, queen g3 and then playing the move d6s. What was playing the game between Dora Bailey against Alexander Indrich? And something I've noticed is actually a lot of the Aziri Grandmasters play this Mamadrov system. You know, also Dora Bailey, Nijat Abasov, who is currently playing the Fide Cants 2024 as, I, as I'm recording this. Uh, but yeah, d6 is a mistake here. You know, Black probably has to play knight h5, and you know, then we can either go for a marginally better endgame with queen g5, or you know, play a move queen e3. And after knight f6, you know, we can choose either to repeat moves or to you know, keep the game going with a move like a3 or, or something like this. Again, we have quite interesting play. Uh, but the problem with d6, and it's kind of a theme that comes up a lot in this variation, is that the bishop g5 pin is just very, very nettlesome. Black can't really break it because h6 runs and the bishop takes h6 and such. And, okay, it's also true, runs into, you know, takes and, and knight d5, which, which does just win a piece. But yeah, the, the point remains they can't just break the pin naturally. And, well, bishop f6 and knight d5 are pretty serious threats. So black played c6 to try and cover it. But after f4, knight ed7, uh, white went for a very direct play with e5 here. You, know, you could also play a3 and play a bit more positionally if you want. But yeah, e5 was also pretty good in the game. We see after take, take, knight h5, queen h4 that, you know, white just has a decisive attack here. Like uh, e6 is a nice move just, you know, using the fact that we either win the knight or after rook e6, bishop c4, we will win the exchange. And white went on to win very, very convincingly from this point. So, a very inspirational win by Dora Bailey against another 2600-ish GM. As for the move d6, which you'll see a bit more often, it might actually be a little bit less precise than knight e5, funnily enough, because now bishop g5, once again, is asking black some kind of difficult questions. Um, and after h6, um, you know, again, knight e5, queen g3 is, you know, transposing back to what we were just looking at, yeah, the Dora Bailey-Indrich game. But after h6, yeah, now we're able to just cash in bishop takes, queen f6, knight d5. You can see how just how great this knight is on the outpost. Uh, and also we're forking here. So black plays queen d8 to defend the pawn. Uh, here we are following a game between Dura Bailey once again against the uh, GM Pablo Zaniki. And in this game, white goes for the move f4. Um, definitely in the right spirit to be playing quite aggressively, though it's worth pointing out you could also play takes. And also enjoy quite a nice edge this way with queen d2. And, you know, probably in the game, black, white was not wanting to have to calculate variations like rook takes e4 and, and this sort of thing. But turns out to f3 there, rook actually kind of runs out of the squares that, you know, rook h4, we can go g3 and, you know, the rook is kind of needed to cover the knight. But if rook c4, knight d4 again, we can kind of see that the, the rook is running a little bit out of squares, you know, king b1, rook a4, and, you know, now just even bishop b5, and, you know, we're just able to kind of run the the rook out of moves and just overload the, the defense as such. Um, so that's kind of a nice point in our favor. But in the game, white played f4, and, you know, it does allow black to play bishop c5 and keep the bishop pair, and, yeah, probably the game is not so relevant from this point. Like, white went on to win, but, you know, his play was probably not the absolutely ideal because black has moves like knight b4 to, to try and create counterplay which yeah just taking on b4 just avoids those problems and if they do retreat say with a5 and knight a6 i mean white's just going to be a little bit better after knight c3 and uh and f3 where you just keep control of the center you just pawn storm the the king and yeah they can try to do the same thing with b5 b4 but it's just going to be a little bit slower and less effective because we have the extra space advantage to support our attack, as it were. Anyway, that's pretty much the summary of what I want to share with this queen d3 system. You know, the mammoth drive attack, which, in case you need a refresher, is knight c3, d4, and then playing the move queen to d3. And while it doesn't give white an advantage, you know, black does get a good game with best play. It's a very systematic approach of castle long, pawn storm the king side. We don't really have to learn any theory, but still we can set some tricky questions and... With a 56 to 57 cent score in practice, we can definitely look to the future with confidence. I know that our opponent is not going to have an easy time finding the right moves to uh, to defend against this attack. So let me know in the comments below what was the favorite part of this video or the big insight you latched onto here. And also, if you are interested in private lessons, just letting you know that I do still have some spots available for students. So 
If that interests you, just use the messenger link or the email in the description below. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the next training. Until then, take care.